Thank you for joining us today, Rob. You have an amazing story that we're going to dig a little bit into. And first, I just want to talk about the journey you've had in your pursuit of happiness before where you arrived today. Obviously, there's been some ups and downs. And as a happiness expert, we're so excited to hear your journey into your own personal happiness. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, first off, I definitely took the hard route <laughs> to happiness. Um, I feel like I was born unhappy. More than that, I feel like I was born depressed almost. And it just got worse as I got older. And despite achieving things like academically, athletically, and even professionally, I mean, I worked for a management consulting firm for a while, I was deeply depressed to the point of contemplating and then actively like pursuing suicide, like I wanted to kill myself. And um, I still have the suicide test marks on my wrist. It's unbelievable, man. I was uh, beyond depressed, you know what I'm saying? And I'm actually surprised as I look back now that I was even functional. You know, something about that, you know, we were talking earlier, and it turns out that we're from the same area, right, yeah. Pittsburgh. And this was something that I didn't learn until later that I, when looking back, I could see how it affected me, which is statistically, uh, Pittsburgh has just as many overcast days as Seattle. And that is something that you wouldn't think about because you don't think of it as a very rainy place, but that overcast, and certainly when... You know, my birthday is in October, late October, but soon after that hit, you'd be staring at a very long, cold, dark, gray winter, and that's certainly going to do its... That's not going to help you out at Dude, all. Dude, <laughs> that played an immense role in my depression. There's yeah. no question about it. Yeah. I had SAD. I had seasonal affective disorder yeah. without question, mm -hmm. and I know that because at later point in my life, when I moved to Miami, I was surprised at how much improved my subjective well-being was. Like, I felt so much better, like, wow, life is great. You know? I had the same feeling in moving to North Carolina and, and being in Chapel Hill, uh, Carolina blue, and it was always sunny. And even in winter, yeah. you had sunglasses on. It just, it was night and day. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Now, obviously, from the outside, being successful, it's hard to reckon where you're feeling depressed internally, but everyone else is seeing you as this uber successful, happy guy. Yeah. And it's almost like living a dual life. Oh my gosh, totally. It was like I had a little bit of schizophrenia or something. It was a very split kind of experience. Um, and I did a good job, not a great job, of not letting anybody in on this quote unquote secret that I had. Um, it wasn't that I was trying to hide it, but people weren't interested, you know? And when you tried to, start the conversation with them about this thing called life and thing called death that like we never talk about and how odd this whole life, the proposition of life itself is. Like we spend our entire lives trying to acquire, achieve or accomplish certain things and we find these people that we can love and we love them hard and fast and then we lose it all like and we lose them all and that just that idea just never really made sense to me. It was deeply disturbing so I this existential angst that just spread throughout everything in my life. And how are your relationships at yeah. this point? My relationships were still um, good for the most part. My friends were good. My family was good. You know, I never felt that I was connecting with anyone on a truly deep level. Like I didn't know or feel like I was known, you know? And um, so that was pretty good. I had a girlfriend at the time. She was wonderful, but we didn't get along. I mean, you know, it was hard. She was depressed in her own right. Right. Yeah. And then you kind of take that on as well. Yeah. So you're both matching each other's emotional states and, and all of a sudden you're on a downward spiral. That's right. The most contagious thing on earth is emotion, literally emotional contagion. Right. And so I had a lot of those kinds of experiences. Um, and so I just decided one day after doing a whole lot of research about how I was going to kill myself, that I was just going to slit my wrist, you know, and um, strangely enough, leading up to that moment, you know, I kind of contemplated the idea of, oh, I'll write a suicide note. And then you're like, what do you say? I mean, what do you say? You know, it's just, I didn't have anything that I felt like I could say that anybody would really resonate with because I had tried to have the conversation in bite-sized pieces with people. But that day that I started to dig the knife into my wrist, the strangest thing happened, man. Like totally unpredictable. I just experienced more peace and joy than I'd ever experienced before. Nothing objectively had changed. But something subjectively, something on the emotional level certainly felt like it did. When you look back upon that now, what do you suppose that was? My mind was completely quiet. Yeah. It, as I contemplated my own death, it was also, also the contemplation of the end of all my problems. So it wasn't death I was seeking as much as the death of my problems. Right. And stopping that voice in your head. 
it's that over analytical, obsessively compulsive the thinking mind that is the very root and cause of all unhappiness. Well, and we spend most of our time, I think you mentioned it, of looking at other people of who can I find that I can dump all of this on to take this off of me? And you're going to continue to play that game until, until you get to any, whatever point that needs to be where you decide I need to take care of that within my, myself. Because that, that pattern, if you are able to bring a lot of people in, it, you're going to see that pattern over and over and over again of people leaving your life because of that. Oh, hey, man, brother, you can preach that all day right there, man. I'm telling you. And you're absolutely right about that. And it was a re- sort of realization and recognition I had around that later. You know, because I was always frustrated. Why doesn't anybody understand me? You know, that kind of feel. And later I came to the realization that a much greater disservice than them not listening to me and not taking on my problems would have been them taking on my problems and therefore coaching and training me away from the very source of happiness within myself. It's mind blowing. It's like they didn't know it, but unwittingly they did the very thing I most needed to be led back to myself, to the source of happiness itself. Now, as the author of Happiness from the Inside Out, yeah. are you happy every day? Dude, I gotta say, I've never been happier in my life. I've never been happier, and it's hard to describe. I've been, you know, sometimes you know, I do some TV stuff, and every now and then I get called in to do a TV show, like a, a chemistry test. You know, it's a panel of experts, you get together, and they see what's, you know, what will the rapport be like if these folks end up with the show together? And they always end up asking me, Rob, are you always this happy? And they don't believe me, but I'm like, listen, it's for me, this happiness thing is life or death, man. Like you don't realize life is so short and it's so long. And if you're not enjoying it, you are wasting it. Like there is nothing more valuable or precious on the planet than time. It's more precious than money by far. You can't save time and invest it and earn compound interest off of it later. Time wasted today is time gone forever. So, you know, for me, every moment truly deeply matters, man. And I've spent my entire life only working on this one thing. So I can't help you guys out with anything else in the whole world. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> and do you found that it's been contagious for those that are around you? Yeah, for sure, man. Like, for sure. And it's even more contagious when, um, you, in the beginning, I was trying to share tips with people and stuff like that. And I do it when it's asked of me. But it's so, so much better to just teach through your living, shining example. You know what I'm saying? People don't need me to tell them to do X, Y, or Z. Just be it. Just be the change. Right. When you're acting it out instead of telling someone, hey, do this, do that, they're more likely to follow your lead. Yeah. It's like the first time I ever discovered what confidence truly was. It was a guy in my life and we went to college together and he was confident on the the border of being arrogant, but he was confident and he would include me in his confidence. He'd be like, man, so much of who we are is wasted. It's wasted on these people out here, man. It's wasted because we've just got so much to offer. And I remember thinking like, I don't think I have anything to offer, you know? (laughs) But the more time I spent around him, the more I just began to embody that confidence without effort. Now, positive psychology is a relatively new field of psychology. And in a few words, how would you describe its core teachings? Yeah, Um, so it's the study in science of what makes life worth living. It's the study in science of happiness and success. So essentially where happiness and success intersects, right? So it was founded by a guy named Martin Seligman, and he mostly studied learned helplessness and depression. But he found that if you remove the learned helplessness or the depression from people, you still don't get a happy individual. You just get like a flatlining one, right? So he said, we got to really focus and figure out what's going on here. How can we make people not just normal and well-adjusted? Let's make them really happy. And so we began studying happy people and the happiest people on the planet. And he basically discovered, in so many words, that happiness leads to success. So happiness isn't only the greatest success, meaning that, you know, the point and purpose of human life and the whole meaning and end of human existence, anything you want to achieve, acquire, or accomplish, you want because you think you'll feel better in having it, right? So that's why it's the greatest success, but it also leads to success in so many phenomenal and dramatic ways. And in your mind, this striving towards happiness, obviously there's going to be ups and downs along the way. What are you telling yourself through those downs now? Obviously, having come out of the ultimate down. Yeah. Oh, great question, man. This is why you do what you do, huh? (laughs) We try, that's for sure. I I would say um, the difference for me is identification. So in the very beginning um, of this journey, I was really identified with my job, and I was identified with the money, and I was was definitely identified with the women. Whatever it was, I was identified with that. Like When that wasn't going well, I'd feel a certain kind of hit you know, to my ego, to my happiness. And over time, 
I've dropped more and more identification with those things, and then it became really about sort of my physical well-being and body and all that. And then you begin dropping that, and then you drop the identification with the mind and your thoughts. And so now the difference is I just don't believe my thoughts, man. Like when they're negative, I just don't believe them. And I don't believe the positive ones necessarily either. It's just all thoughts. It's like a movie on a movie screen. You take a step back and you remember you're watching a movie and it's fun, it can be interesting, it can be sad, but it's all play acting and you don't need to take any of it seriously. You can take it sincerely, but not seriously. And we've all had those moments where we felt this emotion strongly and we held on to it for dear life and we're like, that's exactly how that event unfolded. And then we run into someone else who was there and they give us a totally different perspective. And like, whoa, what are you talking about? Like, that is not how it went. And you're kind of shaking. You're like, wait a second. This is how I felt emotionally. This is how I should believe that event went. And all of a sudden you start questioning, okay, wait a second here. These are just thoughts. These are just emotions. And there have been times where I've been sad when I have no reason to be sad. I've achieved something great. And there are times when I'm happy and I have no reason to be happy because there are emotions that flow. You just nailed it. That's, That's everything. I mean, you said so much there that is just so powerful and a lot of empirical data to support that. So you spoke about cognitive agility, mm-hmm. the ability to choose your thoughts, talk about emotional regulation. At the end of the day, it's our inability to self-soothe ourselves and to regulate emotion that leads to most of the problems in the world, including addiction. Um, you know, so those two things in particular. Um, the other thing you talked about, which is just as important as anything, is the ability to entertain competing narratives, right? Like. Right now, I'm sitting here saying the best thing that ever happened in my life was the day I thought about and started to pursue suicide. Like, literally feel that way. Like, there, there's never been anything that's ever happened that's been better than my contemplation of suicide. And, and now the way I see death is completely different than then. Then it was the worst thing, now it's the best. I, well, that moment when you realize that there's compete, that you can choose that narrative, is, it's, it's life-changing. We've all been able to share that. And my favorite is when we're able to expose that to our clients who sit on the couch. And when I re- repeat what they've just said to me, and then I offer other conclusions or uh, narratives that it could be, and they're like, wait, wait, what, what? And I'm like, well, yeah, the one that you choose, how's it different than the other ones that I've laid out? And they're like, well, it's sort of like what you just said better, or, or, or what I came up with is better what you just said. Exactly. I'm, Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and, and I'm like, well, okay, well, why didn't you could choose this one? And you're like, but that's not the way I thought it. Right. But it doesn't mean that that's the way it is. Yes. And the minute that clicks, their eyes light up and, and then all of a sudden you can see them start to play with, okay, well, if that's able to be changed, then they start looking at other times in their life mm-hmm. where that narrative wasn't well or was well. And they're like, well, well, wait a minute. So like, I just, I just made all this up. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Boom. And then it's how do we now choose and build this to our benefit every day that we go outside rather than taking what we're given? Boom. That's literally everything. I mean, it really is. One of my favorite quotes from A Course in Miracles is, you know, a miracle is a shift in perception. That's the real miracle. You don't realize that everything follows that. But the shift in perception is absolutely everything. And the greatest shift in perception that I've ever experienced, um, you know, in addition to what you said, which was just the recognition that I could have different perceptions of the same experience, um, is the perception of who I am. I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's like, who are you? And if you really dive deep, you're like, well, I'm not a body. I'm certainly not the mind because that's always changing. And I must be something non-physical. That, for me, that realization and then the experience of that makes everything else very movie-like and very surreal. It's fun or it's sad or it's whatnot, and you play your role, but you don't take any of it seriously because it's like we all got the same fate, which is a fate that isn't, you know, at the end of the day, energy, if we're just energy, can't be created, isn't destroyed, can't be destroyed. It just changes form, and ultimately that's what I most deeply and fully identify with. If you do that, nothing else is all that material. Now... We would be remiss. This is the relationship month. Last month, we talked about happiness and the relation of happiness to relationships. And I think a lot of us get caught up on allowing relationships to complete us and just (laughs) looking for happiness through other people. If I just have the perfect friend group and the perfect spouse and the perfect coworkers and the perfect boss, well, then my life is going to be complete. And you're, you're smiling Very and you're, Jerry you're because yes. <laughs> you write about this misconception in your book. Like it, this is a fallacy. So 
what do you think is a better mindset to have when it comes to relationships and the happiness we're looking for? Yeah, man, you guys really do your research. <laughs> um, so I'll say this in advance of this. So the one thing that we've discovered through lots of science and research is that happiness leads to all these other forms of success, including relational, relational success. So success in all your relationships. And what they found was happy people get married earlier, they stay married longer, and they're happy in their relationships whether they're married or not. Also, happy people are rated as more attractive than unhappy people. So if you remember those two things, it helps you to remember and realize that if you could just find a way to get happy, which is often really about learning to love yourself in spite of not having a partner, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whoever, if you can do that very thing, you increase your attractiveness to whoever it is that you wanna attract, and you also increase the likelihood of finding success in your relationships. And in, in that way, like attracting like, yes, right? Yes, that's exactly the, right. The brighter our happiness light is, the more happy people will be welcomed into our life. Absolutely. When we talk about unhappiness is unattractive, well, and part of that is because we're gonna start attracting the wrong people that compound that. That's right. And I think the one thing that Johnny and I talk about a lot is this victimization and victimhood that's going on, where at this point, everyone is trying to be the biggest victim and everyone has a chip on their shoulder and something bad happening to them. And I feel like it's difficult to move beyond that victimhood to find the happiness that we're looking for. Yeah. What do you say to those people who are identifying as victims and feeling helpless in this moment in their pursuit of happiness? Yeah, boy, we've all been there, huh? Mm -hmm. I was there for a very long time. Still got the test marks here on the wrist to prove that. Um, I would say that, um, you know, there's nothing to worry about. In time, these things all resolve themselves. And the truth is that, um, you know, if you are blaming anybody or anything else in the world for your unhappiness, despite how valid it is, it might be very valid. Somebody may have done something very legitimately upsetting, disturbing, violent. But to the extent that you continue to blame anybody or anything for your unhappiness, you disempower yourself to access the solution, right? So you're essentially saying they're the cause. If they're the cause, then they're the cause of both your unhappiness and happiness, and you've disempowered yourself. And so really the way I see it, you know, if you want to be happy and if you want to be successful um, in any respect, it's about taking back your power. But taking back your power isn't something that you get from somebody else, it's something you access within. It's not me against anybody else, it's me accessing that which exists within me. It's a choice. It's a total choice, it's just a choice that you make. But you don't, um, you don't find happiness in the world by focusing on unhappy conditions and circumstances and people. So as a victim, you're really identifying with this victimhood and by doing so, you're, you're focusing on the unhappiest parts of your life and your existence in the world, and you will never find happiness that way. Right. When you're putting the flashlight on the wrong things, yeah. you, you can't see everything else that's in darkness. That's right. You just become an expert in problems by focusing <laughs> on problems, not an expert in solutions. Yeah. And I, I think all of us in our pursuit of happiness and in our pursuit of better relationships look at it as a zero-sum game. And they hear the advice, and we even give this advice, you're the sum of the five closest people, you wanna find positive people and attract positive people, but let's be honest, even the most positive people are gonna have some negative moments. They're gonna have some times where they slip up and they're going through some turmoil, and they may even be on the verge of suicide and depression. How can we be better friends to those people who are going through their struggles? Oh, beautiful question. Just by being the change, it sounds so spiritual platitude-ish, and it is, but cliches are cliches for a reason, right? So just by being that change, like whatever it is that you want somebody else to feel or experience or be, you need to always be that first, and you need to trust that your living, shining example will teach them much better than your words ever could. And the only thing sort of freely given and never received is unsolicited advice. So do not give advice. Like I could tell you right now, <laughs> and I'm the guy that gives advice, but I'm very careful about when and where I give advice. Yeah, we had a guest on previously, Michael Sorensen, last year, who talked just about that exact thing. That mm -hmm. when we're just going around giving people advice, unsolicited advice, it is not only falling on deaf ears, it actually turns the other person against us. They build resentment when it's completely unsolicited. I love the question, how can I help? I think it cuts right to the point. Yeah. And if they say, no, I don't need anything, I, I don't need your help right now, yeah. at least you're clear instead of being like, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what, you gotta change this about yourself and then you'll be happy. Love that question and that is a question I consistently ask myself that's just beautiful because it's so honest and it's so direct and it doesn't come with any judgment. The one thing we know about the most effective therapies in the world, so the things that heal the most, 
is that the actual therapy that you use, or the coaching approach you use, or the way in which you ask people doesn't matter as much as the unconditional regard or unconditional love that accompanies that approach. So essentially, the most healing element in the world is unconditional regard and unconditional love. So my job, when I wanna help someone the most, is to completely drop all judgment, and that judgment includes that I know better what's best for them than them. It's unreal that I should think that I know better what's right for them than either life or than they do for themselves, even if it looks like they're headed down a path to hell. I do, I am very certain and clear about that because I look at my own life, and if any of us look at our own lives, you say, my goodness, the worst thing that happened to me turned out to be the best thing. Everybody was discouraging me from contemplating, not saying that anybody should be killing themselves by God, no. But it's just a good reminder that at the end of the day, um, we don't know what's best for anyone. Right, and and as a good friend in, in our month of relationships here, the best tool we could bring to the job is to just listen. Activism. A lot of times, people are not looking for answers, they're just looking to be heard. And a lot of these dark emotions you're feeling the lack of happiness, the, the lack of gratitude in your life is simply because you haven't been heard. You haven't been able to connect on a deeper level. And a lot of times we go in and we're like, okay, I'm going to fix this person up and I'm going to just put a smile on and I got to get them laughing. They just want to share freely and openly and to your point and be unconditionally loved for that sharing. Mm, it's powerful, man. When I entered this psych positive psychology business and the business of coaching, um, I was convinced I was in the behavior change business. I was oh, change yeah. people, help them change. Woo! I got that one wrong. You know, so over time, you realize and recognize your job isn't behavioral change. Your job is to listen in an active way, and for me, that means non-judgment, non-interruption, mentally or verbally. You know, and it means just holding a quiet, cool, calm, collected, safe space for people to share and to be heard and to be seen. And that in and of itself is unconditional regard and unconditional love, and that in itself is healing. Well, the biggest enemy of being able to be to listen is not being present, and you're not present when you're being overly analytical. And you even mentioned that trying to figure this out and, and overanalyzing everything only drives you farther down the road that you do not want to be going. And the question we get all the time from guys who want to be in uh, to have better conversations, connect better. What do I say? What do I say? What do I say? What do I say? The answers are always in the other person and forget trying to figure out what to say. Be present. The answers are in the other person. They're going to tell you what to oh, say. That's beautiful, man. That's why like the first premise of really um, coaching or great help is a recognition that all of the wisdom the other person is looking for is within them, not you. You don't want to train them to think and believe that the answer is within you, or then that you set up a codependent relationship. So you've swapped one problem for the other. Presence is absolutely everything. You just crushed it. I mean, with presence, it's unbelievable the change that happens without your effort. Just being fully, deeply, truly, authentically present. And that means having a quiet mind. It doesn't mean, and it means not fixing, believe it or not, which is very difficult, especially for men. <laughs> We're <laughs> trained and wired in some ways to be fixers. And compensated. And compensate, absolutely. Right, a lot of our salary and earnings depends on our ability to solve problems. That's exactly right. So it's the first tool we always reach for. That's exactly right. And that's often why men suffer more when they experience job loss or they don't have, have money or any of those things because our understanding and appreciation of ourselves is tied to performance. So we have experienced this kind of performative type of love that's very conditional. Um, and that in and of itself compromises your happiness, um, especially for men, almost more than anything else. Now, we started today's conversation around this voice in your head being on 11 and just leading you down a very dark path to obviously attempting suicide. And today you sit here fully present, fully engaged, being an active listener, seemingly have quieted that that voice in your head or at least got it under control how did you get there what was the yeah. process like for you man oh man it was a process i started with okay so there was a partner at the consulting firm good friend of mine now uh probably the first week into the job he had no good reason to talk to me and you know if you're an analyst and a partner comes and talks to you you've probably done something really wrong. So I was sure I was going to get fired. <laughs> and he said, uh, Rob, um, he did two things that were phenomenal. He, the first thing he said is, Rob, you're fantastic with clients. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but you're fantastic. Now listen, I sucked with clients. I was hiding in my cubicle all day, every day. 
But because he said it, I believed him. And before long, I started doing it. So I learned something from him, the power of expectation. Um, but the other thing he did was he introduced me to what I thought was a children's book. And I was really insulted. I was like, I didn't say it to him, of course, but I was like, why is he recommending this book? There's a children, it was like Sarah and the foreverness of friends of a feather. And it was like <laughs> written in real large print, bro. I was like, are you, are you kidding right now? Cause like this ain't gonna, so anyway, I was like, he's a partner. I better read the book. He might quiz me. Who knows? So I read the book. It turned out to be Abraham Hicks. And they were basically, they basically wrote, wrote a bunch of like children's books that were meant for adults though. They're just little stories. Kids can read them too. But it got me on the right path because I grew very, up very fire and brimstone Christian. So I kind of had a knee jerk reaction in that respect too. So when I found Abraham Hicks, I was like, oh, this is something I can digest. It's all about positivity. So I started down this path where I just continued to find or be led to more and more teachers. Lots of, at first it was Abraham Hicks and then I was like, I'm gonna go to the science world because I need data. I need hard data, man. Yeah. I don't know the about- The analyst in yes. you. <laughs> exactly. Needs numbers. I need numbers, bro. Like, are you kidding? Yeah. And then you know, I, kept, I started practicing everything I would read. I would try it. Like I didn't do the exercise in the back of the book and stuff like that. I was like, I'm gonna apply this to like real life because I wanna see real life results, not mm-hmm. like what I can do in my bedroom. So like I applied and if it worked for me, I would give it enough time. If it worked for me, I'd like track it and write it down. And if it didn't work, I just forgot about it. And I kept doing this forever and it was like life or death for me. It became my career. Like before it was my real career where I got paid you know, based on it, it was my number one life priority and activity. So I just kept doing it, I tracked it. And then that, that sort of journal of happiness tips and tricks that worked for me became happiness from, from the inside out the book. And when we talk about happiness, we, we'd be remiss without talking about the comparisons to others. Yeah. A lot of us are unhappy because the person on social media is happier. The person next door is got a nicer car. They have more accomplishments. They have more than us. So how do we deal with that constant comparison and now more than ever with social media i mean in the past you compared yourself to your neighbors maybe the guy at the bar now i can compare myself to someone in australia i can compare myself to someone in the alps who's skiing right now because i picked up my phone so how do we deal with that man wow i love that question um for me it was beginning to redefine success you got to really dig into the success the success thing because it's such a trap so i was like i got to redefine this whole thing in a way that I can win, (laughs) you know, because if you're competitive, you want to win. So it's like, how can I redefine, you know, and change the rules so that I can win? So I was like, okay, I will define success as happiness. For me, that was the goal. I was like, I can, I can't be richer than all these people. And I certainly can't have more awards and I can't have prettier girls or whatever it was. I was like, but I can, I'm going to make this my thing. This is going to be the thing I succeed, succeed at. So that's where I started. And then I kept dialing that back and kind of, you know, over time, it just organically began to like shift a little. And then it became not about being the happiest person, but being the person that was most committed to doing the work, like the happiness work, you know what I'm saying? So then that became the thing. And then over time, I just dropped the whole comparison thing altogether. And um, it was actually great spiritual teachers and books like written, um, Osho, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but I started reading more of his stuff, but I just started to drop it more and more. It was easier to drop the comparison and the competition when you're coming at life from a perspective of happiness instead of success. You know, if beauty means a whole lot to you and you have to be more beautiful than other people, then you're always gonna be in a bit of a conundrum. But if happiness is your thing and you recognize that empirically, happiness leads to success in all those other th- areas that you want, you know, it leads to more money, it leads to a longer life, it leads to a healthier life, it leads to better relationships, then you can make happiness your top goal then you can kind of drop or let go of the comparison and the competition. I think what's been so enlightening for me, especially the last nine years living in LA, is having amazing opportunities to meet people that others look up to and have all those success boxes checked and, and meet them on a personal level and, and feel the pain that they're going through internally and the struggle and the unhappiness that they have, although they're projecting outwardly on social media, et cetera, this, I have it all together, look at me mindset. And I think that has been a a big awakening of like, wait a second, just checking all those boxes externally for everyone else is not making that person happy. So why am I chasing those things? Beautiful. That is a great point. And it's something that um, you're reminding me of now. When I started practicing as a positive psychology expert and coach, I began having more and more of those experiences too. When I first started, you know, I had a good couple of friends. I was working actually in the entertainment business while I was going to school, and a couple of celebrity friends basically referred me out. And 
As a result of that, I had people in my practice that were very wealthy, very successful, very famous, and freaking miserable, like hearts absolutely you know, empty of any happy, happiness at all. You know, Their pockets full of money and their hearts were just full of misery. And I remember thinking, this is wild. You know, is it really success if you don't have fulfillment? Like, you know, like Tony Robbins says all the time, fulfillment without, or I'm sorry, success without fulfillment is failure. Yeah. And when you look around and you feel that you're there, but you're not there because you don't have the relationships in your life you can count on, you distrust everyone, and all you're doing is chasing likes and comments, it's a very dark place to be. Yes. Now, is there a time that it is advisable to compare ourselves to others? Yeah. Obviously, you talk about competition. Yeah, totally. So, I think it could be helpful. Um, depends on what your goals are. Like, if you look at somebody like Michael Jordan, right, or any really great athlete, you know, they find themselves inspired and motivated by the comparison and the competition, right? <clears throat> and it can often serve um, desirable ends, right? But, you know, if you're, it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are to win a race or to be the greatest athlete, um, it can be very, very helpful. Um, that being said, um, I think that in terms of overall subjective well-being and life satisfaction, it's going to do nothing but compromise your ability to be truly, deeply happy. You know, I meet lots of great, incredible athletes, um, but I wouldn't describe most of them as happy and fulfilled as much as, um, you know, maybe they're in the psychological flow a lot, and that's probably the happiest state. But yeah, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be my model for how I describe happiness and fulfillment. And there are tons of exceptions to that, of course. To go along with that, obviously those guys need to find that fire to, to, to get moving, to inspire them, to get on the track or wherever it's going to be where they're going to find that competition or in the corporate world on that ladder. Um, you know, and that, that fire, if not managed, can consume them. And so what do you tell those clients of yours who seem to use that fire as motivation so that they're able to see uh, and be careful of, the, of that very thing? Oh, man, I love that question. Um, a couple of things. The first thing is, um, you know, use it if it's serving you. Okay. And you'll get to a point where you know it's not serving you anymore. You'll just feel it. Don't worry about that. You know, it's the great thing about life. When you're honest with yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And even if you're not honest with yourself, life will be honest with you. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so life will take care of that. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing I uh, try to encourage them is to, and I point them back to some of the science, like what they're really wanting to do if they want to be extraordinarily successful in any um, you know, performance um, area is they're wanting to access that state of psychological flow. What Mike Cheek sent me high talks about all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And that state um, can, you know, you can kind of get there a little bit through the co comparison competition can push you in that direction. But if you want to really be in that state, that's a state where you're not nearly as self-conscious as you'd usually be or time conscious or any of these other things. And so that's a state where really your mind is quieter than all that. Mm -hmm. And you're not being consumed by the competition and the comparison. And I encourage them to move in that direction. And so there are little tips and tricks we have to help them get in that state of flow or in the zone. Um, and yes, they're competing at an all time high and they're more focused than ever. And they're no longer distracted at all by the comparison and competition. And that's how you become a Michael Jordan. You know, he, he uses a lot of that stuff, but you got to realize Michael Jordan at the end of the day is able to tap into the zone of the floor or Kobe Bryant, for instance. And, last, yeah. and let's be honest, they have off nights. They, they don't always achieve that flow. That's right. I think a lot of us, we pursue perfection. We see other people outwardly as perfect. We look at the greats of all time, and even with Sugar Ray here, like he talked about moments where he didn't feel worthy. So we all go through that. It is a bit of self acceptance and compassion along the way, too, that's going to help in that journey instead of just looking at it outwardly of like, I have to be in flow state 100% of the time or I'm doing something wrong. Totally. That, that, that's why it's so important and helpful to optimize um, just for the peace and equanimity really, and the, and the subjective well-being. I like using that word sometimes because happiness can get a little funny, but it, it is happiness. Um, and there's some interesting research, actually, um, which makes a lot of sense, which has found that, you know, look, this happiness thing is kind of like a bell curve. You know, the happier you are, the more successful you are, the more money you make, the longer you live, all these good things. And then you get to a certain place where you're so happy that you don't care about so much money anymore. You don't care about winning as much anymore. And you do a little drop off. So sometimes you see the, the most extraordinary or successful people in a particular sport or industry are miserable, right? And it makes a lot of sense. And that's why they that's how they become billionaires or so successful is they just continue to use that fire 
in that comparison and competition to motivate them. But if your life is really about that, you know, and you didn't enjoy most of the journey, it was just mostly about the fire, is that a life well lived? You know, if you spent, even if you've accomplished these great things, people forget about those great things tomorrow. The right. next person comes along and they beat those records and you're forgotten. Now, this idea of flow state, right? We're, we're turning down our analytical mind, right? To, to be in that zone. Yeah. You mentioned you have some tips or tricks. Yeah. I, I'd love for you yeah. to share them with our audience as well. What are some tips? Because I know flow state gets thrown around a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's something that has become this hot new trend of I, I need to get in flow to be better performing at work, etc. How do we get there? Yeah. What are some of these tricks? So it's a great, great question. So from a scientific perspective, first of all, your level of competence in the activity has to be pretty high. You got to practice, okay? Like the the more you've practiced, the more the easier it will be to access that flow state because you can let your subconscious take over, right? So that's the really important thing that people sometimes want to enter the flow state like first day, and that can be a little tough. You can do it, but it's a little tough. So ideally, when it comes to flow state, the challenge is just barely above your ability to reach to reach or exceed that challenge, right? So that's a huge piece of it. But one of the things I encourage people in a more simplistic way is just notice the people and places and things that allow you to easily and effortlessly and enjoyably enter a flow state. Often you're unaware of it. Most people actually in their job, even if they don't particularly like their job, are in a flow state at work without recognizing it. They don't even know it. You know, we put beepers on people and send mm -hmm. them out into the world and say, and then we beat them and say, hey, you know, tell us whether or not you're in a flow state. And most people say, oh yeah, I was in flow state. They don't even know it. So notice those activities, people, or places that allow you to enter the flow state easily. It might be the beach, playing with the puppy, playing with the kids. Who knows? Everybody, for everybody, it might be something different. Music, by the way, very, very helpful for people. Um, so, and then if you can, try to create circumstances and conditions that include these environmental cues or factors as much as possible. So if you're going to the gym and you notice that certain songs put you in the flow state, use those songs. If you notice that seeing beautiful men and beautiful women helps you get in this flow, um, that flow state, you know, make sure you go to a gym that's like that or if it's clean, whatever. But try to find and use whatever's working already, but just increase it. Does that make sense? So it's replicating the signals from past flow states That's right. as best we can. That's right. You can sort of do a close study of your own life and just begin to more, to sort of increasingly incorporate all of those things into your you know, current activities. I remember being able to see, for myself, recognizing flow state for the first time, and as a musician, seeing performances as a as a kid on television or whatnot, and 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 seeing it and wanting that so bad because what I knew what was being performed was difficult, but when seeing it, it seemed very simple, and then also that person who is in that moment and in that state as if they're transcended from being a, they're almost immortal and they can live in that place for eternity. And not only that, they sort of do in other people's minds and that, in that, that state for themselves, uh, they spend the rest of their lives continually looking for opportunities to get back there. Yes. It's such an addictive you, thing. Wow. It's, it's, and it's wonderful. You just identified two things, two additional tips and tricks. I just want to highlight what you said, cause it was so profound. Um, one is, Watching or observing other people in flow state can help Beautiful. you get in flow state. So that's really important to remember, you know. And um, even mimicking them, right? Yes. So as Johnny was talking about, oh, some episodes ago, looking up to his idols and then picturing himself being his idol when he's practicing guitar. Mm -hmm. We heard the same from Kobe Bryant. He would imagine himself having that left-handed dribble. Exactly. Having that baby hook. So that flow state, when we recognize it in others, and then we can mimic it and put ourselves in their shoes, we can work to get towards it. Beautiful, beautiful. And you just you just highlight another one, which is the visualization, right? Mm -hmm. Or guided imagery. It's And especially with that, you're really wanting to focus on sort of assuming the state of the desire or wish fulfilled. You really want to get, you know focus on the state of being there. you know. And sometimes actually imagining the challenges that would present themselves um, is very helpful in that imagined state because you could see yourself overcoming them and it allows you to stay in that flow state when the experience happens. So very, very helpful. There's certain images, I think, that are burned in all of our minds from sports heroes that are just, those moments are so iconic. Being from Pittsburgh, I think yes. both of us can see a, a Lynn Swan oh. Super Bowl, the, the juggling catch, yes. coming down with it, knowing that that was him in flow. Maybe Franco Harris, uh, the Immaculate Reception, being at the right place, right time, why did that happen? And those images are burnt, and, and those 
we we look for those in our own lives. Absolutely. Know? And it's interesting. I love that you um, use that example and you say it in that way because I think, you know, these days too, lots of people talk about being in flow or in alignment with life itself, with just the day to day, not necessarily a particular activity. Maybe they're not an athlete, maybe they're not a peak performer, but they want to be in alignment and flow with life so that things work more, work out for them more organically or sort of effortlessly. And I think that there are some common elements there, but the one is just a quiet mind. You know, you can go about your life today, even if you're not a peak performer, and if you can learn to quiet your mind, you will find that life seems to cooperate with you in ways that it didn't before, but it's not that life is cooperating with you, you're cooperating with life in a way. Um, and all of a sudden relationships work out, or if they're not meant you know, for your greatest good, then they just dissolve. The things happen. Now let's talk about that that unquiet mind because some of our <laughs> listeners and I've struggled with it too are quote unquote pessimists. So you talked earlier, you know, we want to strive towards happiness and happiness attracts people into our lives, but I'm a pessimist. How do I become that optimist? Yeah. So uh, the first thing is lots of scientific study, um, which you guys are, I know, voracious readers. But like, so the one thing we know is that optimism can predict success in almost any individual or team sport. Um, it's predicted uh, every single presidential election, so we can analyze the speeches. It's kind of just kind of crazy when you think about it, really, because you're like, how could this particular candidate, that particular candidate, be more optimistic, um, and therefore have won? But optimism predicts success, success in almost every life arena. There are a couple of exceptions. I think counting might be one, but there are a few, right? <laughs> um, literally. So um, that's the first thing is to realize that. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, when it comes to uh, both optimism and quieting the mind. What I found helpful is, um, first of all, leaning into the science and then trusting that if you lean into the optimism or better, you lean into the no mind, which is dropping thought altogether, that there's a deeper life intelligence, infinite intelligence, that same intelligence or life or an energy that keeps the planet on its <laughs> axis, you know, sort of rotating on its axis and revolving around the sun, the sun shining, your heart beating, your lungs breathing, your mind or brain orchestrating it all, that same infinite intelligence is within you. And that the best thing you can often do is get out of the way. And the more you, you know, if you try to control any of these involuntary functions, you would actually just mess it up. Ever try breathing on purpose or like making your heart beat at a certain, it's ridiculously complicated and senseless. And so to the extent that you can trust, I think for most people, it's trusting that in my quieter mind, I'll think more creatively, efficiently, effectively, and productively and enjoyably it's really trusting that and then playing with it and practicing it. We've got all kinds of little tips and tricks we do there too. And obviously when we talk about pessimism, a lot of that's tied to fear. Yeah. And, and fear is a perception. You know, we can conquer fears. We can one day be afraid of heights and the next day we could perceive heights as just another challenge. Yeah. And I know Johnny in, in class today, I was hanging out, getting ready to, to prep for the show. And one of the things you talk about is, is asking yourself the question is, are there other possibilities to what I'm thinking and feeling right now? So if I'm a pessimist and I'm feeling really negative and I'm feeling like the world is ending and it's all coming crashing down on me, asking yourself, are there other things at play here? Are there other potential outcomes yeah. that I'm not thinking about, that I'm, I'm too hung up on this one negative outcome? Could start to challenge that pessimism. Well, and to go along with that, I mean, how often do we do that in our own lives in business at, at the Art of Charm? where something will happen, we have an immediate reaction to what we think it is, and then we challenge that, and we have this debate all the time, coming here, we'll throw a bunch of ideas out on something, and then we have a laugh about it. And these exercises, once learned, once ingrained, and and that they're your go-to of going through this process, I mean, just the process itself is enjoyable. You nailed it. You nailed it right there because so in two things one is you're absolutely right um doesn't matter how good or how logical your idea is about the success of your business your relationship or your life you could very well be wrong and life has its own logic okay mm -hmm. if, you, if you live long enough you quickly realize that sometimes the best idea goes viral and the worst idea is you know or you know the worst idea goes viral and the best idea you never hear of again and so that's the first thing i'm always clear about is like huh i think i'm so sure about this and I've been so sure about these other things that I've prayed for in my life, and often a lot of them I've gotten, and I've been unhappy for it, or it's turned out in the worst way humanly possible, like in a way I couldn't script. So that's the first piece. The other thing is just practicing it and optimizing for the happiness itself. If you don't, if you, this is the thing about the happiness thing. If, you, if that's not your goal, 
it's impossible to really convince anyone to be optimistic. It's like, why should I be optimistic? Because it might not turn out well and then I wouldn't have managed my downside or my risk. And it's like, I get it. But if you're optimizing for happiness and for peace and for equanimity, then you suddenly begin telling the better feeling story based in truth because it's only going to be a better feeling story. Right, we're not living in fantasy. No, it's not about snow job. But as you begin to tell the better feeling story about everything in your life, you realize that while you cannot guarantee the future, you can guarantee the present and while you cannot control so many of the conditions and circumstances in your life, it's even more important to control the one thing you can, which is how you feel right now. Who knows? You could die in five minutes, five days. So control that and then trust that the science... And the scientists aren't crazy that if you do that, if you tell the better feeling story and you cultivate this optimistic explanatory style, you're actually going to increase your odds of success in the world, right? And this is why we often see with great leaders, the most, there's a study that was replicated just recently that the, the most competent leaders are not the most successful, which is kind of disturbing. And in fact, often it's the most incompetent leaders that are most successful that rise to the top the fastest. And they said, why is that? They said one word, confidence. Yeah, Dunning-Kruger effect. (laughs) Dunning-Kruger effect. That's exactly exactly what it's called. That's right, exactly. Johnny's favorite. Well, Uh, one thing I want to talk about with pessimists too and and pessimism in general is is this need to turn the impersonal to personal, the temporary to permanent, Mm -hmm. and the local to pervasive. Yeah. So we don't allow for any other explanation. We tie everything... Personally, this is me. We take everything at, that could be temporary and make it now permanent. Yeah. And that's where the pessimism sprouts. And then, oh, could this just happen a one-off or is this just always going to be a constant now, right? We make yes. it pervasive. When you start to question these things, you start to tease away and realize that, hey, you know what? I'm just, I'm taking this personally. I don't need to take this personally. Or, you know, this is just temporary. The sun's going to rise tomorrow. And you know what? This has not been pervasive. I've also lived on this planet 36 other years where this was not the case. When we start to tease it apart, we can actually find that place of optimism, even if we are this pessimistic and prone to this pessimism. The other thing that I find so fascinating about the science is it's not a personality trait that you're born with. Mm -mm. It's a way of thinking. And when we realize that we can make these choices and change the way we think, then we don't have to identify as the pessimist. We don't have to hold on to it and cling to it as if it's some security blanket. Oh my goodness, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the most fascinating fields of study right now is epigenetics, right? And um, you know, you literally turn on and off hormones mm-hmm. and DNA simply by the thoughts you choose. Like that is wild to me, right? And I used to think, and for a long time, scientists did too, that there was just a baseline level of happiness or optimism and you were just stuck there. That was your ceiling. And now they realize that's crazy, that's silly. You can think different thoughts and therefore rewire your brain in such a way that you make thinking those thoughts easier, but you also increase your optimism, happiness, and therefore success. It's fascinating. Well, to go along with that, I mean, all the work that you have done to get yourself in this position so that you could challenge these narratives and, and, and live a happy life. I certainly know the road that AJ and I have been on uh, with this ourselves and, and why we love shouting it from the literal rooftops. Um, but, but also, you know, when you've done this work and you hear it from people around you, you start, okay, I can't be around this because I've done all this work. And we I, we were laughing because we have done such a great job of walling off um, and making sure that anyone is in our inner circle has these ideas, has these attitudes. And yesterday I had found myself at a dinner with an old friend from childhood and he had a guest with him. And, and it was my first time in a long time being exposed to that horrible, bitter, chip on shoulder, negativity. Talk about it. He's from Beaver Falls. He's from <laughs> I, was I know like, Beaver Falls. Oh yeah. <laughs> And now, now when I'm when I'm around it, it's in a it's in the capacity that we're teaching, and it's the, the they're they're willing to learn and want want to hear how to fix these things. But when you, I was it was mind blowing, and not only it's been so long that I just couldn't believe just how deep it ran. And even if I was to say anything or challenge any of the narratives that was coming out of this person's mouth, that it's like not, nothing's going to change. And in fact, they're going to double down because, well, then that means that what they believe could be faulty. And now we have a, um, 
Well, well, when you, reality right, when you pull that thread, thread in a sweater and yeah. you're not wearing scary. the sweater. And then people get really crazy. <laughs> now, this is yes. a great example because you talk about happiness regulators and energy vampires. Yeah. And we talk about value vampires, which is this exact thing. Toxic people. Yes. People who are going to stay where they are in that scarcity mindset and compete with you in ways that look to tear you down. How do we deal with them? Johnny had dinner with one and was struggling. We all encounter it. How do we deal with them? Yeah, boo. Um, that can be a real challenge and a real <laughs> opportunity, right? An incredible opportunity um, because for me, the way I see it is um, everything and everybody in my life is a personal trainer for my own unconditional happiness. And I will consider unconditional success sort of in the same vein. And so the first thing is realizing that, that it's not about them, it's about me. And that I'm the one with the problem if I'm the one feeling uncomfortable, <laughs> not them, right? So as soon as I take back my power, um, then from that place, I do a couple of things. One is I double down on my commitment to be perfectly peaceful and full right of equanimity. You know, I'm, it's all, that's, that's where I'm at. I sit there in that space and I stay there and I remain there. And then I, if I need to or want to communicate, I communicate from that, from that place, from that peaceful place. And usually um, I used to say things in a sort of declarative manner and now I'm better off asking questions yes Ask questions there's no judgment in the questions but they're nope. questions and they're leading questions often i'll be honest right right you know mm -hmm. and um so i ask questions and just like oh that's interesting Can, you know tell me a little bit more how's that you know how's that working for you is it serving you do you feel like it's serving you does it feel good you know just genuine questions and i want to know maybe i'm wrong about that so i want to so sure. yeah and um so i do that and then um as i'm doing that though the most important thing that i'm doing the entire time is just staying emotionally regulated right you know i'm just abiding at what we I'm abiding in the self, which is that place of perfect peace. Well, I think that's the challenge for a lot of us is we don't realize that we, when we encounter this, we tend to reward their bad behavior. We feed the trolls, we feed into it. They get a rise out of us, we react. And when we react, that just emboldens them more. And we're in this vicious cycle downward. And then we leave beat up, our self-esteem takes the hit and they're gloating and they're enjoying themselves in their negative space. I think a huge challenge, and we get this question a lot, which is why next month's theme is all dedicated to dealing with toxic people in your life. What do we do about those relationships with family and coworkers? Yeah. Where, you know, we can't just walk away from the situation. We gotta be in it. We are living with these members in our family. We are going to work with them every day. And listen, you know, career changes don't just happen overnight. They don't fall into your lap. So a lot of people are, are stuck in, a job market that has some scarcity tied to it, they don't want to leave. How do we deal with these people that we can't quite remove? Yeah, great, great point. So I keep interactions short and sweet. It's important. So I'd rather have more frequent, but shorter and sweeter interactions, <laughs> right? Maybe we have five minute conversations, or maybe it's 30 seconds. We just, just checking in, dad, how you doing? Hey mom, just checking in. And they, you know, they're gonna get off on the rant, and oh my goodness, mom, I'm gonna call you back in just a little bit, I love you so much. You, you stay in that place of peace, you, and the second you start to become reactive or judgmental, you, ha you gotta check out. And you gotta check out in the most diplomatic and kind way that you can. Because you won't, by checking out with anything less than kindness and diplomacy isn't- They're gonna you know, feel yeah, it. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So that's number one. Um, well, number one is the peace and equanimity on the inside first. Number two is keeping interactions short and sweet by far. Um, sometimes it comes to the point where you actually have to have a conversation and just to say, and um, I'd use an acronym. So before I speak, I think, and think stands for true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. So whatever it is I wanna say, I try to say in a way that is as true as possible, that is helpful, that is inspiring, that is necessary. I leave out all unnecessary information, that means usually the past or the future, and kind. And so I'll do what I can to then tell them, I love you very much, and I love the idea of seeing you happy, and I love the idea of me being happy too, and I know it's both possible for both of us. And so you know, for that reason, I'm just gonna take a little time to, to you know, just collect my thoughts and be with myself for a little while. And if you want to do the same, that's great. Or if you want to do something else, that's great. But I trust you'll be happy either way. And then, you know, so then I just leave, I just leave that relationship for a little while. Um, I still love them, but I can love them better from a distance. Um, but I just find the words to share with them. They might not understand, but I'm not attached to them understanding. They don't need to understand. Right. And there implicitly is not judgment in that. What There's you're no saying. judgment. There's no judgment. Right? It's saying, this is what I want for both of us. And I hope we can find it. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. So I think that's, but, but at the end of the day, again, it really is about, because what's so seductive about the whole experience is you get drawn back in, just like you said, where into thinking that somehow through your attention, 
even if it's negative attention, that you're going to extinguish this undesirable behavior. But no undesirable behavior <laughs> is ever extinguished with attention. from attention. Yeah, with attention. Uh, I mean, we get, go in YouTube comments and you'll, you'll find <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. exactly that. The, what we're talking about here and dealing with toxic people is difficult. It is adversity, yeah. right? Especially when we're working with these people, when we're living with them as family members. And what's so interesting is that positive psychology says adversity is not a bad thing. It's not something we need to run away from. In fact, building some resiliency and ability to regulate emotions is a great thing for us long term. Uh, yes. So most of us think of or know about post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And we assume that when something really bad happens, when you face a lot of adversity, you experience post-traumatic stress disorder. But the truth is, is that we mostly experience post-traumatic growth as a result of adversity. So believe it or not, even when you're not trying, you often most frequently grow from the bad times. And so it's important to remember that. And that's also the way in which you build resilience. So the more bad things that happen, the stronger you get, the stronger you get, the more, the better you are at handling those bad uh, situations in the future. Um, that being said, part of that resilience is also hopefully building a more optimistic explanatory style. And therefore you experience less you know, adversity over time, at least not the same kind of adversity. Um, so yeah, it's a great, great um, reminder for folks um, that when you're facing the worst in life, it often brings out the best in you. Yeah, it makes us the strongest. And this idea of David Goggins, right? These oh. mental calluses, right? Yep. Just like getting ready for the Tough mutter, we're building calluses on our hands from all these pull-ups. It's the same thing. You can't run away from that adversity. Actually building the resilience to it allows you to get closer to the happiness that you're pursuing. Absolutely. Um, I remember Abraham Hicks, I mentioned him a little earlier because it's the ch first children's book I ever read and uh, turned out to be an adult book. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they would always say, you know, it's the contrast that makes life so beautiful. And it is like the sweet wouldn't be nearly as sweet without the bitter. And look at my own life and not that I would wish bitter experiences on anyone, but it's been the bitter experiences of my life that have made me who I am. And without the unhappiness I experienced for decades, I could not be in this position today and with every bit of confidence say to you, I've never been happier ever before. Thank God for the bad times. And I, I, well, I think that a lot of people forget that advertising is built in exploiting you feeling uncomfortable so that you won't go through that adversity and you'll turn to whatever product they'd like to sell you to get you through that. When in actuality, going through that uncomfortableness is what you actually need. Home run right there. <laughs> like, yeah. Ah. Yeah. And I struggle with that. Actually, it's funny because being in the helping profession and being a happiness coach, all the marketing and advertising experts would say, Rob, you've got to advertise the problem and push <laughs> on the pain. To, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. That's so out of alignment yeah. with who and what I am that I guess I'll just have to be broke. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool, man. Cause I got the ultimate treasure inside anyway. So happiness is success. It is, right? it is. It's the ultimate and greatest success. Thank you for joining us today. Where can our audience find your book and where can we watch you on TV? Do your thing. Yep. Love it. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. You have no idea how much I appreciate not just this conversation, but who you guys are. I mean that. I've been listening to your podcast for a long time now. Oh, thank you. Really, really um, deserve commended for the job you guys do. You all can check me out at coachrobmack.com and also on all social media platforms at Rob Mac Official. You can also check me out Monday through Friday, 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific time on Good Morning Level Land that is live streamed across all social media platforms. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Right on. Thanks for having me.